Pessoal, esse é o último coloque do ano, então eu agradecer aí a presença, né? Super legal, a gente conseguiu vencer a barreira da, de potencial da pandemia, né? O Oliver fala português muito bem, bem coloquial, é, mas a apresentação vai ser em inglês, técnico. Se alguém quiser falar de futebol, aí ele cai para o brasileiro, nem né? português, aí ele fala brasileiro. Não. Uh, então, uh, from now on, I will shift to English. Uh, Dr. Olivier, he got his PhD at the University of Grenoble in 1990, working on superconducting mesoscopic disks and superconducting networks under the supervision of uh, Bernard Parentier. Okay. Uh, and then he moved straight forward to Brazil. He came to the uh, Poque Rio to work uh, with Paulo Costa Ribeiro and Mauro Doria. He stayed there for one year and a half, uh, approximately, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, after this period, he got back to Grenoble, okay, uh, where he started to study uh, plasma modes in thin uh, superconducting films, in wires, thin films, and wire uh, networks. Okay. After a while, uh, in 1999, uh, he started uh, uh, the Grenoble quantum dynamics uh, grouping uh, to, to study superconducting qubits and proposed for the first time quantum electrodynamics experiments using superconducting qubits. This is the research that he has been doing since then, uh, uh, probing and studying a large variety of superconducting qubits. It, uh, uh, they are studying currently uh, these high fidelity quantum measurements on transmon qubits. So we, I, I guess you're going to explain what a uh, transmon here. A quantum phase slip and long uh, just some, uh, junction chains, many body physics in a superconducting qubit platform. Josephson quantum amplifier and quantum dotting hybrids, aluminum, uh, germanium, aluminum, nano wire uh, uh, heterostructures. Okay. Uh, he is uh, currently, presently, he's the, the director of the research at the NEL Institute at the University of Grenoble and the director of the consortium Laboratory of Excellence, uh, LANEF in Grenoble. So, uh, very pleased. So, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And for a big opportunity to present this session. Okay. Uh, I, I am sorry, I, I would uh, prefer to speak in Portuguese, but it's difficult for us to speak in physics and Portuguese, but uh, and uh, to be a mask. So I will concentrate on English to make a conclusion, but by some moment I switch in Portuguese, you said stop, and I go back to English. Because uh, in my mind, that makes some confusion between Portuguese and English. So, uh, what I, I would like to start is to present uh, the place where we are doing our research. So the city is called Grenoble. It's a city which is localized inside the Alps in, in France. And uh, we are surrounded by very big mountains in Alps, with now all of these mountains that are with snows. And the city is a big city of physics. And uh, our Institute NEL, where I do my research, is localized uh, here. And it's a very important city of solid state physics. So you, you can see that the uh, Grand Institutionnel, there is three uh, international facility laboratories, one of amenity field, another from the ozone sources, and the last one is the uh, European Synchrotron Radiation Facility. And uh, Grenoble is one of the biggest cities in terms of the solid state physics in uh, France and to Paris. So uh, before I start, on my uh, topics on uh, superconducting qubit, I will allow you to flash you uh, what we are doing in our work on the world. And our hope is uh, a constitute of five permanent people, uh, content Fisher, who just joined our group uh, this year. So it's a young uh, researcher starting his uh, activity. Luc Vichard is professor at university, Cecile No, Nicole Larocque, who was a, is a colleague from 10 years now, and myself. So we are working on different topics. And uh, of course, today I, I am going to concentrate on superconductive qubits and more precisely on quantum measurements. But uh, we are also developing new kind of qubits, protective qubits or functional qubits, but this activity is led by quantum Fischer and Nicola Roth. There is also a uh, new research domain that has been developed in our group. It's quantum limited amplifier, and I'm going to amplify macro source in the quantum limits, and this is driven by Nicola Roch, and uh, there was very nice results, which was used in the last years in this domain. You know. 
Another important thing is with the left hand junction, which can break the circuits, which could be quite complicated. And here you have, for example, the Josephson junction chain, which constitutes uh, like a meta material. No, it's okay. Go ahead. Okay. Like a meta material, where the modes can propagate along the chain. And the interest of these meta materials is you can adjust its characteristic impedance, and the modes can be very strongly coupled if this chain is coupled, for example, to a two-level system. And for example, there is a new result that has emerged in our group where we have coupled qubits to this chain of modes, and there will be a very strong coupling between the two-level system and the mini modes which are interacting. So in some sense, you, you, you start to study many body physics in a limit where there is a strong coupling. So in a limit where it was not so much studied in the past. The last development that we are doing is uh, doing monocrystalline hybrid junctions. And here you can even see that these points here, oh no, no, this is an artifact of a, uh, of a presentation. But if you look at a transmission microscope, electron microscope, you can see that there is uh, it's monocrystalline germanium, monocrystalline aluminium, and the both are coupled with a monocrystal uh, uh, atomically flat interface. So you can build some kind of quantum transport, which is quite complicated and structural, where the physics could be very rich. Because here you have superconductivity, here you have a superconductor, germanium, and here you have superconductivity. So what we have demonstrated is this, this kind of circuit. You could have some quantum bus, which in there you have a charge spontaneous. But also, you could have some proximity which start to uh, propagate inside the germanium field. So, all this kind of uh, research, uh, we are also starting on this domain and there is interesting results. But today, I would like only to concentrate about introduction on superconducting qubits. This will be my first part, and second part will be quantum measurements. So, first, it will be the first half an hour will be quite uh, introductive. And so don't hesitate to ask questions if you, if you want to, to have more, and I can answer afterwards. So at the beginning, we can say, OK, we want to build a quantum system. So it's already finished if we use a superconductor, because as you know, a superconductor is one plane. The, the wave function which describes the superconductivity is a macroscopic quantum state. So you can say, OK, I, I am already inside my superconductor, a quantum state. But in fact, for quantum information is not enough because you want a second state, which is also quantum, and where you could uh, manipulate the two states uh, together. And so uh, a superconducting uh, state, which is uh, the wave function, which is uh, developed by the theoretical way, is not enough. But uh, also you can see that uh, it's quite complicated to develop excitation here because it's inside the gap, and inside the gap, it's known that there is no excitation. So how we can produce some excitation inside the superconductor? In fact, it's not so complicated. You can build a superconducting circuit, which is constituted with a capacitor and an inductance. And this capacitive circuit, it has no losses. And if you work at low temperature, you can describe the dynamics of current, charge, or flux inside the circuits by this kind of Hamiltonian, and where the, the charge which correspond to the, the capacitance and the flux to the inductance are conjugate variables. So you can see that uh, to describe the circuit here is the, it's exactly the analog to a mechanical harmonic oscillator that maybe you have already studied, where you have a particle with some mass, which is given here by the capacitance, inside a parabolic potential, which is given by the inductance. So this kind of circuit, uh, by a mix of studies that he has been performed in the last century, you, we know already that if we are at low temperature, at the, at the rest, the circuit is described by a ground state. And this ground state is described by, by some wave function that is called here, I noted uh, the case zero. And this ground function has some uh, distributions of charge, which indicate that this ground state already presents zero point quantum fluctuation. So inside this circuit, the capacitance has some charge which fluctuates even at zero temperature or at very low temperature, or even if you have no, uh, sorry, it still fluctuates. And it's the same thing for the current or for the flux. A second information that we can extract from this analysis is that the energy levels inside this LC circuit are quantized. 
And uh, the states who describe these quantizations are electromagnetic number states. So for the state zero, it corresponds to zero excitation. First state one, it corresponds to one electromagnetic photon, I would say excitation, two, two electromagnetic photon excitations. So we can say, okay, is this difficult to realize such kind of quantum system, which has now many excitations, which it could be described by quantum mechanics. And in fact, it's quite easy. If you take, for example, a piece of aluminum, you put a, a hole inside, a big hole of some centimeter square, you will have some, what is called a 3D cavity. And this 3D cavity accepts some electromagnetic modes, which has very, very low losses. And where you uh, you can describe its dynamics by this uh, Hamiltonian quantum mechanical Hamiltonian. Of course, so this is uh, you have here some uh, 3D cavity made by aluminum. You could do also resonator with a, a sheet of aluminum on top of a substrate, and this will be one T resonator because it's a thin line. You could also do a resonator with a LC circuit to have here the inductance and here the capacitance, and so you build a LC circuit. And all of these circuits are superconducting with superconducting states. So the dissipation is very weak and the Q factor, the quality factor is quite low. You can say that even if you work very hardly, for example, people of our host group, here it's well known, but they develop a cavity which could have some characteristic time of one second. So current time of one second. So you have a state where a photon can remain in life during one second because before it's relaxed to ground states. But I would say that this superconducting resonator, in spite of its current time very long, is not yet a qubit because it's a multi level system. And if you want to manipulate these quantum states, you will not be able. Because if you start from the ground state, which is easy if you start at zero in a, at rest, you can apply the microwave source. So this is a equipment that you can buy. You couple to the, microwave, to the LC circuit. And what it will occur is you are going to apply the microwave exactly at the resonance between zero and one. So you are going to start to excite zero to one, but because one and two is exactly at the same energy levels, you will start to excite the, also the transition one, two, two, three. And at the end, when you apply the external, micro, external microwave drive, you will get not a manipulation between zero and one, but you are going to build the coherent states that is a coherent superposition of many uh, number sets. And this is not at all the purpose for a two-level system where we want to manipulate and build two levels which are highly quantum because this current state is very close to a classical state. So it will not be so interesting. So to overcome this problem, we need an harmonicity in cyber potential. And for that, we can build uh, an inductance which is highly anharmonic. And this uh, inductance which is highly anharmonic is done by a Josephson junction. So a Josephson junction is nothing else, but you have two superconductors, which is coupled by a very thin uh, tunnel barrier, where you accept uh, Cooper pairs, which can tunnel from one side to the other. And we know from the 60s, and it was the demonstration of Josephson, that uh, the relations of current and voltage inside the Josephson junction is given by this law. And you see that the current is uh, proportional to some constants of the circuit, which is called the vertical current, and this constant depends on the uh, gap of a superconductor and also on the sweetness of a tunnel barrier. But you see, and this is very important to catch, that the current is not proportional to the difference of phase between the two superconductors, but it depends on the sinus of the phase. So it's a relation which is highly non harmonic highly nonlinear. Okay. And uh, the second law, is, sorry, the second law is more natural is that the voltage is dependent on the time variation on the difference of phase. So when you apply this kind of circuits inside the, 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 the circuit that I told before, so we replace the inductance by a of some junctions, now is the new Hamiltonian. And you see the new Hamiltonian is completely different than before. You have still the capacitance, which is look like the, the mass of a particle, but now you have a potential with no more harmonic, but it's strongly anharmonic and is given by a cosinus function. So instead to have this kind of situation, the situation is more like this. And you see, because of this anharmonicity, now the levels are no more equidistant. And this would be an important properties for the flow rate. 
So if you now drive by a microwave field, you will have still uh, energy level which is quantized. But now, if you drive by a resonance field which is exactly at the resonance between zero and one, you see that the, the transition between one and two is our resonance. And so the system, for, with some condition, will not go outside of the zero and one uh, space. And so you will remain always in these two first levels. And by this way, you could describe the dynamics by this multi-level system by a simple two-level system, like a qubit. Okay? And uh, only for your, uh, to, to make a flash, in the past, in the beginning of, uh, in 2004, for example, we, we studied these multi-level transitions and try to understand the transition between two-level and multi-level transition in this domain. So uh, how we can achieve this kind of circuit? So this is, and this kind of circuit is now called the transform uh, circuit. So uh, the, the easiest way to see how is made the transform circuit, you, you have here a 3D cavity inserted inside a, a copper uh, aluminum uh, block. And inside this cavity, you put uh, a circuit on top of a, here it was a sapphire substrate. So you have big capacitance, big two parts, which are deposited. And these two parts are going to produce a capacitance between them. And you are going to short circuit these two parts by a small Josephson junction. So the small Josephson junction here is very small. And you, if you describe the circuit, so you have a capacitance, which is short circuit by uh, Josephson junctions. So you retrieve exactly these descriptions and the Hamiltonian that I showed you before. And uh, this kind of circuit, the size of this circuit is quite huge. It's, well, here it's not 15 millimeters, it's more five. This size is typically some hundreds of micron. Okay, but the junction is very small. It's typically few 0.1 uh, micron by 0.1 micron. So this is what is called a 3D transform. So in the following, I will explain you a circuit that will work, which was a 3D transform. We can have also a 2D transform where all the film, now the cavity is no more a 3D cavity, but it's a 2D cavity. And your transform is produced here, where you have here a small Josephson junction in, in parallel to a capacitance, which is interdigitic capacitance. Nowadays, I would say that the typical geometry that the people are using is this kind of transform, where you have the central island is coupled to the ground plane, and this produces the capacitance. And there is a small Josephson junction, which is made by a squid, where you can tune the critical current by a plane of loops. So like the dimension is comparable. Uh, the dimension yes, the all this the free design here is described exactly by the same Okay, they do the millimeters as well. No, no, uh, no, here. Sorry, but uh, yes, it's some width of my. So, yes, uh, the size, I could change a bit. So, here maybe the size was more tens of micrometer, yeah. but here it's uh, 15 to 100 micrometer. Yes. So, they are not very small. The only thing that is very small is the Josephson junction. Okay. So now, for example, because we are now a two-level system, if you apply the microwave drill, a microwave signal, you can manipulate the quantum state. And for example, here I, I have some results where if we start with the ground state and you apply the microwave signal, you are going to excite and uh, you observe uh, radio oscillations. And if you uh, the, the, the manipulation of the state will be defined by the durations of this type of signal. So for example, if you do a microwave signal, which is exactly these durations, the zero states come back to zero states. But if you do a microwave signal, which is exactly that, the zero states will be transferred to the one state. And in the, uh, simply, the one state will be transferred to the zero state. And of course, if you want to make the time which is one for all, for that, so not in order to the middle, you can start to break the current superposition between zero and one. So you start from the ground state and you apply the, what is called pi over two pulse. And in this case, you arrive to this kind of the current superpositions. So uh, to me, to summarize uh, this part, so if you have a transform qubit, you could already do some uh, single qubit quantum operations. And for example, you can do, if you do a pi pulse, you can transfer the one to zero and the zero to one. 
And if you do a pi over two pulse by only changing experimentally is quite easy, you reduce the time by a factor two, you will do a pi over two pulse where you transfer a one to this square superposition and zero to this. And this is interesting to know is that to notice that this kind of operations has no equivalent in classical uh, logic gate operations because it's called the square root of not. If you apply two type this operation, we will retrieve the not operation. But this will not exist in classical computations. And this is a, typically a simplest example to show by, by manipulating this quantum state, you can achieve some uh, uh, operation that are uncommon to classical comp computation. Bon. So maybe the main idea here is by playing with the duration of the microwaves, its amplitude, and the phase of the microwaves. In fact, you can control the quantum states completely in all these possible current superpositions. So this is for single qubit operation. We can think a bit about two qubit operation, and this is not so complicated, I, I would say. So I, I describe here a circuit that has been developed in Sacré uh, in Paris in uh, 10 years ago. And you have here one transform qubit, another transform qubit, and these two transform qubits will be coupled by this capacitance. And uh, so, the two transforms are different. So the two transforms are two different frequencies. So the microwave pole that you send are at different frequencies. So you can manipulate the quantum set here and this one independently. And at some moment, if you want to make this two, two level system to coupled and to make some experiments of coupling, it's you, you, you are going to change the flux inside the two loop in order that the two levels which are at different energy will be in resonance. And because they are in resonance and they are coupled each together, there will be transfer of energy between the two. And by this way, you can realize swap or square root of swap operation. So you can transfer the quantum state between the two units. So it, it has been demonstrated in this experiment. <laughs> in this experiment, for example, but they can do this two qubit universal gate is square root of swap operation, which is described by this uh, 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 matrix. And uh, there is also single qubit operation. So in some sense, in this platform, it could have been possible to do any kind of uh, quantum algorithm. But be careful. Huh? So this was a demonstration on the two qubits. Now, if you want to do a quantum computer, it's a much complicated thing because you need to have many qubits. And also here, you don't think about decoherence. Of course, this logic of to do quantum algorithm is correct if the system remains quantum for a long time, okay? And so this was not demonstrating all this part, okay? So I need to, to make a flash of what is the state of the art of today, okay? So I, I take a, an example of the book of uh, Zurich in uh, Andres Valrad group, and uh, they recently published a paper where they coupled 17 qubits together in the same platform. So you have 17 qubits in the same chip, and uh, I would like to flash a bit how they do that. So at the beginning, you have a substrate, and on this substrate, you are going to, to perform this uh, transmon island as I, I presented you before. So I need to, to be. So they, they do, first of all, this kind of island, which will be one part of a, of a circuit. So this is the yellow part. After the, so, this yellow part is connected to the ground plane, which is all the rest of the circuit by a submodule of some junctions. You, you have some line here, which can be excited the qubit, so by the microwave signal. You can tune the flux as in the previous experiment by applying an additional line while you change the flux in order to adjust the two qubits in, in resonance. You coupled all these qubits together by some uh, blue line but they are going to couple the different qubits all together. You, want, you couple these qubits to a cap T in order to perform the measurements. And the measurements is, is using some uh, uh, multiplexing line where se this line can measure several qubits all together. So in this kind of experiment, they were able to study a platform of 17, 17 qubits and testing some error code correction or something like that. So this is a different platform that exists in a more uh, 
very strongly funding groups. So these groups are very uh, with lots of money in some sense. And uh, now uh, the, the most uh, important platform is uh, IDM platform with 400 qubits. But be careful, in this platform, it doesn't mean that the system is perfectly quantum. So we build the system, but it doesn't mean that the system is completely driven by quantum mechanics. So we should be careful. So now I, I would like to make a transition to the second part. But before going into the second part, I would like to make some uh, 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 remark about uh, this superconducting quantum circuit. And first question is why this kind of circuits work so well? So I will say that uh, you see that uh, now we are people are building 400 qubits and 20 years ago when I was starting, the people was working with a single qubit and demonstrating that the single qubit was a bit working, but not so much. So there was tremendous progression in this field. And we, should, we could ask why superconducting system is a good system. Uh, uh, so this is some point of view. Huh? So maybe there is a complaint by over, but I think this is our important point of view. So first of all, we benefit from the superconductivity. Superconductivity is a very funny state, which is very strong and stable with no losses. So this is some, something which is really given by the, the nature of a superconductivity circuit, so aluminum, for example, and this is a big advantage. But there is also the fact that the circuit are, uh, you play with capacitance, Josephson functions, inductance, and by changing the way that you build your circuit, you could build different Hamiltonian. And this is very funny because you can fit the Hamiltonian that you could want. And I would say that up to now, I am not sure that there is a limit to build a, a wanted the wish Hamiltonian that you want to test in this circuit. So I need to, to flash a bit. Here it was a starting on the qubit, which was the phase qubit or transform qubit. So in Cordoba, we work on these things since the beginning. There was also the charge qubit where now, uh, here, the, the, the variable which was the most important is the phase. Here, is, it was the charge inside this island, which was contact. And this was called the charge qubit. It was the first qubit which has demonstrated in 99. It was made by Nakamura, and it was a charge qubit. This is the Ploxonium qubit, but uh, Quentin is starting in our group. And this has a new uh, parameter, which is the flux, which is inside this loop. You have an in loop between an inductance and the Josephson junction, and this flux is quantized, and you could have some coherent superposition of flux states inside. And this is a flux on your qubit. It's very interesting because, in this case, you have a two level system, not a multi level system, but a real, much more real level system. And uh, there is a new generation of qubits which try to emerge, is called a protected qubits. So you try to, to change and complexify a bit the circuits in order to be more robust against the current. And this is a project that uh, Nicolas Roch is starting uh, in Europe. So you can see that flexibility, you playing with capacitor, inductance, and generation junctions make this a big advantage. And we can make, in some sense, if I want to be a bit pro pro provocative, we can do any atoms as we want. We are not depending on this 100 atoms but the nature is given, but we can play and do the, the atom that we wish. This is a bit provocative, but it, it, it's a bit... Uh, so another thing which is more technological, nanofabrications. Uh, so the way to build that, we use the uh, fabric technique, which is mainly used in microelectronics. And my, microelectronics, you know that this is a very leading industry. So the technology of nanofabrication is very well dominated. And we benefit from this to do all these circuits. So it's very nice to do the, the circuit that we had and we wish by doing this kind of uh, techniques. Another thing, which is a bit more detailed, but adding Joseph, Josephson Junction, all that I showed, and I think, yes, I think all the superconducting qubits are made with aluminum. Okay? And uh, uh, this, Aluminium is very funny because if you look at the Joseph's junction, it's not so nice, but in terms of quality of properties of quantum physics, it's very robust. So this is a chance. Uh, if aluminum was not existing, but only niobium, for example, we'll be never achieve this result that I showed you before. 
we are not using optics, but we are using microwave. And in some sense, microwave is between uh, one to 10 gigahertz typically. And this is the things again, because of uh, mobile phone is a technique which has, um, and also because of radar, because of military. This technique is a very, very mature technique with many, many components that you can play. So we are doing uh, optics experiments using this uh, microwave techniques, which is quite sophisticated and uh, uh, dominated. And the last thing that I would like to mention, that this has evolved, so maybe the first time that I make a seminar to motivate people to work on superconducting qubits, it was maybe close to 20 years ago, and the people say, yes, but uh, dilution is completely crazy system, is not controlled, is difficult. But now there was a revolution in the beginning of 2000s on dilution system, it was the dry dilutions. So because of the dry dilution, you don't need more liquefier. So what you need is electrical power. And because of that, this, when I start, the qubits experiment was only to make in the laboratory of fundamental physics. But because of this revolution, now it's spread in all the part of the world. Any group who want to develop that, if he has the money, because it's expensive, he can buy a dry, a wet, a dry dilution, sorry. And even this dry dilution, you can put in your living room, if you want. Of course, it's big space, but you need only electricity. So this is important uh, input. And you should not think that uh, this is the real limitation for the quantum computer. This is not at all the limits for a quantum computer for superconductivity. Really, the, the problem for superconductivity quantum computer is problem of coherence. And uh, we are still far to be at the right level to do a good quantum system with very long coherence time. So I would say that today, uh, the current time of the qubit is typically the best one was is one millisecond is in fluxonium qubits, and, uh, and transmon is more about 300 uh, microseconds. And uh, really, a good objective it should be to achieve 10 milliseconds. So, if you increase by one decade the current time, you can improve the quality of your uh, quantum operations, the fidelity of the quantum operation, but can lead a very substantial uh, result. So to achieve that, there is a protective qubit that I already mentioned slightly. We can change a bit also aluminum by new materials. And for example, tantalum seems to be a, a good materials to do this big capacitance path for technological reasons. I, I think, I, as I showed you in the first slide, crystalline junctions could have a good uh, future because any defect inside the junction can produce uh, absorptions of energy, so absorption of a qubit, some, and so relaxations. So crystalline junctions is still not at all studied, but could be an interesting point. Another point that could be important to develop, and this is a real limit of a transmon. The transmon is a multi-level system, so it's a bit limited because there is many levels which are closed. So sometimes you are not really in the two-level limits, and it's difficult to beat the two-level limits. So developing a platform with fluxonium qubit, for example, where the two level is far tuned to the third one, could be an important issue. So people are still trying to improve, it, improve a single and two qubit gate operation, but you see that they are arriving to quite a high level now in the superconducting qubit. I would say that quantum measurements is still one thing that is quite weak, and there was not so much a study on quantum non emission property in superconducting qubits. So, so, so you have 10 minutes, <coughs> sorry, 10 milliseconds uh, for the coherence time. Yes. But how many operations can you do in this uh, time? So, typically, uh, for fluxonium, for transmon, typically, uh, in our case, and this is typically, if I would say, 15 nanoseconds. So, 15 nanoseconds with a coherence time of one millisecond, it could be maybe 2,000, no, uh, 20,000. Uh, operation that you can do, but be careful when you do operations, you start to reduce a bit your current time because you perturbate a bit the circuit, so you add some new channel of coherence and take on it. So the, the, the scaling and people, I think this is a good target to find a platform with 50 qubits which are working well. And if we arrived at this level, we don't need to go to 500. If you have already 50 qubits with a very long current time, we can do many things with, with uh, fundamental physics or studying some uh, uh, 
quantum simulations and uh, also to to perform start, starting to play with the quantum computer. And I would say that Chronoble, our objective is not to compete against Google and IBM, but we would like to, to arrive in maybe 10 years in, uh, I would be retired, but uh, with 50 qubits could be a good objective. And also there is a mini resource now on error correction in order to, to, to correct the fact that the system loses coherence. So in, in the second part of my talk, I will concentrate on quantum measurements. Yes. So, uh, yes. So quantum measurements. So now it will be more dedicated, but it's a way also for you to see what means quantum experiments and what is the problem and how we build new experiments in the top. So uh, usually for any quantum experiments, People have described the measurement system. You have a quantum system, you have a meter, and you are going to observe a meter by some observable. And by measuring the meter, you will inform about the qubit state. So in a superonity quantum circuit, but this is also correct for many other quantum systems, we are going to couple the qubit to a cavity, and we are going to measure the transmitted signal of a microwave signal of a cavity. And so we are going to measure the intensity of this microwave signal, the intensity of the phase of this transmitted signal. And uh, by probing this, you will get information on the qubit state, okay? And uh, you can see in this description, but in fact, the physics of the coupling between the two-level system and the cavity is very important to describe the quantum dynamics of the qubits, but also to improve the readout performance. And uh, I will say that uh, in superconducting qubits, quite all the results are performed when the qubit is in the interaction with the cavity through elliptical interactions, dipolar interaction, if you want. And these dipolar interactions are going to uh, produce this kind of uh, coupling Hamiltonian that is a very well known Hamiltonian, this I learned when I was in Brazil, because this is a, a system which is fine, the quantum mechanics. So you have here two level systems with a mass of the of C mass B. You have here the cavity, and the coupling between the cavity and the two level system is given by this exchange of energy between the qubit and the cavity. So this is very studied, it's James Cummings Hamiltonian with these dipolar interactions. And uh, you can say, okay, there is exchange of energy is something which is dangerous because exchange of energy, the qubit can lose its energy, it means relax to the ground state. But in fact, if you do these approximations by making the two-level system far detuned to the cavity, this exchange of energy is quite limited. So you need to do a perturbative calculation or estimations. And in these perturbative descriptions, you can reduce the jet coming Hamiltonian to what is called the dispersive Hamiltonian. One now, there is the cavity, there is the cavity, and there is the coupling, which is simplified to a perturbative but we call cross care coupling because you are going to, to change the frequency resonance of the cavity when you change the qubit states. So, by changing the qubit states, you, you are going to shift the resonance of the cavity. So, imagine this is the cavity when you are in the ground states. And when you prepare the qubit in the excited state, this resonance will be shifted by two chi, this um, uh, quantity. And because of these properties, now you, we can understand how we can read out the qubit states. So if you apply the microwave signal, which is exactly at the resonance, for example, of a root root, this is the transmitted signal amplitude. So if you put exactly at this frequency, you will have a high signal amplitude when the qubit will be in the exact state. But if it is in the ground state, the amplitude will be very small. So by measuring the amplitude of a transmitted signal, we know if the qubit is excited or in the ground state. So this thing seems to be uh, perfect, but in fact, there is many drawbacks. This is, people don't say that, I say that because we make something which is alternative. So I want to criticize this part, and I think it's correct to, to, to be aware about the limits of this, because the people put it under the, 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 the carpet. So first of all, you see that this dispersive limit is a bit in the opposition condition to have a strong cross-cap coupling. 
because if you have a big dispersive limit, it's obliged to have a key which will be smaller. And so if you have a sheet which is small, we will have difficulty to distinguish the two different resonances. So this is the first limit. The second limit, that uh, you, you have some relaxation channel. And this is very well uh, described in the system because your original transverse coupling is this exchange of energies. So when you describe uh, in this, so it's a bit technical, but it could be important. When you describe here, you make some hypothesis, and you find your qubit is no more initial qubits of a first Hamiltonian, of a gentle Hamiltonian. It's a qubit where the qubits are dressed by the cavity state. And in particular, the, the eigen state of a qubit is dressed by a small amount of ground state of, uh, with a ground state, initial qubit. So you, you have some, sorry, you have some relaxation process which exists, and this is called Purcell effect or relaxation channel, which exists and could limit the, the quality of a qubit, and in particular limit if the qubit is not so uh, detuned to the cavity. The last uh, limit is uh, this readout could work well if we have a large amplitude signal, many photons inside the resonator, but it has been observed that as soon as that we have two photons microwave photon inside the resonator, it starts to perturbate the qubit, and the description is no more working well, okay? So, because of that, it was interesting to think on another solution, okay? And uh, in Grenoble, uh, we, we were uh, start, uh, thinking that uh, many years ago, so I would describe that, but typically at the same time, there was, so this was the gel from Hamiltonian coupling, but we can say, okay, maybe we can change our circuits, yes? Uh, just how long does it take this measurement to be made? What, which kind of how long does it take? The, the previous one, you 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 sweep the, the no, but microwave like, away and you see where the uh, yeah, yes, but this is uh, well, I will give you some time domain measurements okay, oh. uh, later in my experiment. But here, you don't sweep the frequency, the frequency is, is fixed. And you only measure at this frequency the variation of intensity of signal. Oh. So you will see that uh, in, in our experiment, we have measurement of 30 nanoseconds. Each nanose 30 nanoseconds, we get some results. But uh, I will not be more detailed. So, so uh, this was the proposal of uh, a group of uh, Alexander Blay, where they tried to propose a different coupling, which was driven by. Uh, you see now the Hamiltonian, the origin of coupling is different. You have a sigma Z with the electric field intensity, which is uh, coupled to the sigma Z matrix. So this was the first proposal. There were some demonstrations, but it doesn't go further. I don't know why. And parallel to these studies, we study in 2013, a new coupling, which is completely different to this one, which are this kind of description, which is not more a perturbative description of the chance coming Hamiltonian, but it's directly linked to the circuits. And uh, I will explain you in the next slide how we can implement directly this coupling. And only for your information, this uh, preliminary, preliminary work was made by theoreticians, and it was a collaboration with Igor Denis, which was a Brazilian guy in Grenoble. And uh, after we do experiments, and I will say that uh, uh, there is now uh, the group of VJ in Mumbai who are working also in this kind of coupling, which is different from the dipolar interaction coupling. So how we can implement this kind of new qubits, and can we do readout, which could have good performance with this readout, with this new coupling? So this is a bit more, uh, so the next slide will be a bit more technical, technical but it could be interesting to, to follow. So what we are going to build is a new qubits that we call transmo molecule. We call this because we have a transmo, which is another transmo, and the two transmo are coupled by some inductance and capacitance. So you have two artificial atoms that they are coupled, so you have a molecule in some sense. And uh, you see here that this is the critical circuit, and in reality, the circuit is deposited on top of the silicon substrate, which is this uh, rose color, and the aluminum is white. So you have this big pad, which are going to produce this big capacitance. And this capacitance is short circuit here at the center by two very small Josephson junctions, which are going to make these two pads connected together. And the way to do this inductance 
we are going to use a chain of Josephson squid where we can tune the flux inside this, this chain in order to tune the inductance. So, so this is a detail that uh, we know. The only thing that uh, it's important to, to notice here we have a big loop with a flux which is inside this big loop, so corresponding to this loop. And in all the rest of my talk, this flux will be quantized to an integer number of flux. This is very important to describe the Hamiltonians that I, I, I will present now here. So if you study these circuits, and this I, I already made many presentations maybe here on this, but now maybe it will be clearer and simpler. We have two modes because we have a, a system in terms of electrical engineering, you have three nodes. So it means that you have two normal modes in this kind of circuit. This is standard classical electronics. And the two modes that you have, if this is symmetric, you will have a, a symmetric oscillation mode, which will be the, the red one and will correspond to the transmont qubit. And there will be an anti-symmetric mode where the phase are opposite, sorry, are opposite between the two junctions. And this will be the green mode, which will be a readout mode. So this is a bit of a detail. But when you calculate the Hamiltonian of this circuit, you can describe the qubit mode by this. This is calculation without approximations. Okay? So you have the, the qubit mode, which is exactly described by the transmont Hamiltonian that I showed you before. There is the, what I call now here after the readout mode, which is an unharmonic oscillator, but with a, a strong uh, linear response. And there is the coupling between this new mode, which is given by these terms. And uh, you see that this term integers the coupling between the transmont qubit and the readout mode. And what it is funny, if you expand this coupling, assuming that the phase of the two modes fluctuates close to zero, which is the case because we choose the parameter of the circuit to be in this limit, you can describe that, that the coupling between inside the circuits, inside the molecule, the coupling between the two modes can be described through a rotating wave approximation by this cross cap coupling. And what is also interesting is that now the coupling strength is given by some circuit parameters and could be quite huge, typically 70 megahertz in, in, in our circuits. So you could have a very strong uh, cross cap coupling between a readout mode and the qubit mode, which could be interesting for the readout. So this is not the last part of the story in terms of engineering uh, the system. You have a molecule. The molecule has this interesting coupling, which is very original with this cross cap coupling. And here you have no more dense coming Hamiltonian. You have only these terms, which is the leading terms of the coupling, this one. But now you need to couple to outside to perform some readout. So you need to couple so to some microwave signal to outside. And for that, we, we should adjust. This is really experimental way. We will put our substrate of our transmont molecule inside the cavity. And the cavity has this electric field, which is vertical in this line. And if you put the circuit of the transmont molecule exactly at a line along this spine, these things, it will be interesting because by this way, there will be no coupling at all with the polarization mode of a transmont. So there will be no dipolar interaction between the qubit and the cavity as it was being made in the past low-over experiments. But the coupling will be only between the cavity and the readout mode. And this coupling is very strong between the cavity and the readout mode. In such a, it's so strong that at the end, there's no more meaning to speak about cavity mode or readout mode. It will be polariton mode, which is a mixture, hybridization between cavity and uh, cavity and this readout mode. So to summarize, at the, at the beginning, we have this transmont molecule, which is coupled to the resonator only for this transverse coupling between the readout mode and the cavity. But because the strong coupling of that, this resonator and readout doesn't mean nothing more. And we will call now polariton modes, which are resonance modes that we probe in the experiments, which have its own resonances. And it's a hybridization, this polariton mode, between this readout mode and the resonator. And what is interesting is that these polariton modes will be coupled to the two level systems, to the qubit, through this uh, cross cap coupling. So at the end, we have a polariton mode which is coupled to the cavity for this kind of coupling. So now we go to the readout measurements experiments. So what we are going to do 
is we are going to, so here is the two polariton mode. And you, you see it's as in the previous slide, when you change the field states, it will produce a shift on the polariton mode. So this typically is some shape like this. So you have a qubit, the resonance of a polariton when the qubit is in the ground state. You have a polariton resonance when the qubit is in the excited state. And you have a very strong shift between them. And you see that typically here it was 50 megahertz of difference. This is a huge coupling, much larger than the usual one that the people use in the dispersive limit. So if we work exactly at this resonance frequency, you will, be, you will have a peak of resonance of a polariton mode when the qubit is excited. So if the qubit is in the wrong state, the transmitted signal will be weak. And if it is, the qubit is in the excited state, the signal will be strong. So you can expect so, to perform measurements at constant frequency to have a low signal, which would be, of course, noisy. And at some moment, if the qubit go to the excited state, you will see a larger signal. So this is one kind of plot, but you can do also plot in the IQ plane, where the back wave signal will be described in amplitude and phase. So when the qubit will be in the wrong phase, it will be described by this uh, plot, which will be centered to zero, no signal amplitude. And when the qubit will be in the excited states, the plot will be shifted to the zero amplitude by some finite amount. The problem on that is this is an experimental one is that if you put some value, so if you say, okay, in the maximum, I will have 50 photons inside the cavity, but the cavity is coupled to outside, you can calculate the flow of micro photons. It typically tends to power eight photons per second, the flow, and the other photon is not optical photon, they are at typically 10 gigahertz, so it's very small energy photon, and if you put power, it's typically a flow of power of 0.4, 10 to what of power that you want to measure. So it's a very low signal. And if you compare the thermal noise power at room temperature is three decades higher. So you want to measure a signal that if you read at room temperature, it will be completely erased by the room temperature fluctuation. So how we can, uh, of course, at room temperature is not a problem because we are close to zero Kelvin. But now we need to amplify the signal to room temperature in order to overcome this thermal noise power. So we can buy commercial amplifier, and the, commercial, the best commercial amplifier have typically a gain of 20 dB, so you amplify by the factor 10, the amplitude, or 100 the power, and you have three Kelvin, uh, so, and you have a noise temperature of 3 Kelvin. But if you compare to our uh, shift of uh, resonance of a polar mode, you see that this three Kelvin will produce some noise, which is too large, and will make mix the two signals together. So we will not be able, because of this overlap, to distinguish nicely with the high fidelity the two signals. So to overcome this limit, it's important to develop a new kind of amplifier, and this has been made in a group with, uh, by Luca Pana and Nicola Roth. So they, they develop a new kind of parametric amplifier that uh, they can amplify and with a temperature noise of 400 millikelvin. So we will instill a factor 10 in terms of noise. And because of that, now we can separate the two signals. And only for, for, uh, to see a bit the dynamics in this term of quantum technology, uh, from this result, they are starting to build a company to sell this kind of amplifier uh, in uh, all the world. Okay, they are only starting now, but it's interesting because it's a startup which build themselves their circuit and they can sell already some circuits to other people. So it's, a, it's not a startup which sell high days, it's, they sell really uh, the bags. So bon, I, I will flash this. Uh, and now I come to the experiments. So first experiment that you can do is to say, okay, I prepare my qubit at rest and I measure it. So if I measure it, and I will not measure in this kind of, I could then, I could do, but at the end, we are going to project the signal in the in phase uh, plane. So you will have a Gaussian distribution for these two signals. And it is what you see here, you have two Gaussians. Uh, so you have the transmitted signal, 
uh, no, no, this is a history um, histograms. So you have a uh, count of uh, measurements as function of this amplitude. So you see that the main signal is center to zero. It means that the main signal has zero amplitude. So it corresponds to the ground states. But you see that you have a second question, which is detuned, where you have an important uh, possibility to measure uh, a signal which has a finite amplitude. So this corresponds to the ground set, and this corresponds to the excited state. So if we put our circuit on the ground state, at the end, we show that we are not a qubit on the ground state. You have a qubit which is on the ground state with, uh, I would say, maybe 90% uh, 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 of chance, but you have a few percent to be the excited state. This is in logarithmic scale. The standard deviation may be important. The standard deviation. It, it, yes, so standard deviation are given by this warning here. Yeah, right. But what's the size of the standard deviation? So, but uh, what we do, we try to optimize in order that the standard deviation, you see, the, the, the overlap between the two are quite, the system are quite separated. So the standard deviation in this measurement is not really the limitations. Yeah, the part for by the more than one sigma. Yes, exactly. Yes, because you see that uh, here we are right to overlap. And this is uh, two decades below uh, in terms of count. Okay. So, but here really the problem is that our qubit is excited by thermal fluctuation inside. And in fact, we are working in the division and the effective temperature to get this result corresponds to a temperature of uh, 45 millikelvin. So, if I, uh, I want to uh, improve this, what we do, we perform a pre pulse. So you perform the first measurement. From this first measurement, you know if you measure in this first measurement the system on the ground set or excited state. And after you do your real readout pulse, and you are going to post-selected all the results where the first measurement did that you are on the ground state. So by this way, you filter out all the system which was in the excited state. So and this you get these blue curves where now the readout pulse give you mainly only results where the qubit is in the ground state. In some sense, by being, doing this post-selection treatment, you are able to prepare your ground state with a fidelity which is very close to 99.9%. Also, this experiment show that you have some nice properties in terms of quantum non-demolition, because it means that the papers do not perturb too much your qubits, because you can do a second pulse, which is quite consistent. I will come back on that. So if you do now a full estimate of our quantum measurements, this was made by Remida Sundil uh, during his PhD thesis. So you have, this is the two blocks corresponding to the ground state and state state. This is the figures where we project the measurements in this axis here. So you have this, for the ground state, you have this good line with a pre-selection selection. Pre -selection. So you have a good uh, preparation of the ground state. And now if you excite the qubit, you will get, by your pipers, you get the red line. So you, you see that when you do a pipers, the main result now show that the qubit is in the excited states, but you see that it starts to emerge a second quotient, and this amplitude of this second quotient is related to the fact that the qubit, between the moment that you excite the qubit and you perform the, the results of your measurement, the qubit has some probability to relax on the ground states. And this was the main source of error in this readout. Nevertheless, in this readout, which was the first generation of this new readout scheme, we, we have already a fidelity of 97, which was quite, uh, uh, quite interesting. And uh, the, the error of this relaxation was due to the fact that our first generation of qubit has a relaxation time, which was quite short, of three microseconds. So, uh, during the thesis of Vladimir Michalkov, we do a new generation of qubits where we change completely the geometry. I will not go in detail now. And in these new generations, the, the relaxation time was uh, one decade better. And uh, in terms of uh, readout fidelity, we got fidelity which is very close to the state of the art on superconducting systems. And only for uh, your information, so the readout time here was 150 nanoseconds. The time to acquire one point in this historic histogram diagram. And we estimate that the 
l'adoré de photons inside the polarito mode was typically about 10. So I want to be maybe a bit faster because now I, I was close to, to the end, a few minutes. So uh, we, we try to estimate the quantum non dimension measurement of our video. And to do that, we do always this initial nation by a pre-pulse. And after we do two readout pulse, which is exactly the same readout, and we are going to compare these two readouts. So we can imagine that this, if this readout destroys the GVs, the second readout will not give any results. Or if this readout perturbates a lot of GVs, the readout results here will be something different. So here we plot the correlation between the two measurements. Here it's a in this axis, we plot the results of the first readout, and in this axis, the results of the second readout. So the results on the first readout show that when we take the qubit in the wrong states, it's mainly on the wrong state. So this was the first question. And the second readout give more or less the same results. You see that there is a small probability to excite the qubit. This is due to uh, excitation of the qubit, but this, all the results were more or less in the diagonal. Which indicate that the two correlate, the two measurements are strongly correlated, and that the, the quantum non the measurement is not destroying the qubit state. When we prefer on the excited states, we are still mainly the results in the diagonal, but we start to see some counts here, which indicate that between the first measurement and the second one, the qubits start to relax a bit. But nevertheless, in this case, we show that the quantum non evolution was quite good. Which was quite uh, close to 99%. So, because of this quantum non devolution measurement, we can do now a quantum trajectory. And this was done by Remy Dasselville. So, here I show you uh, time evolution of the qubit when we prepare the qubit ever in the excited state on the ground state, and we start the measurement at the time zero. So, you see that here in this. Uh, the trajectory, each pulse is an integration time of 30 nanoseconds. So this is the shortest time of readout measurements. And here you can see that we can strongly distinguish between the excited state and the ground state. And at some moment, you could have some jump from the excited state to the ground state. And here you have this kind of quantum jumps. So this is uh, from this uh, trajectory, we can also estimate the quantum non devolutions, which was quite uh, close also to this. Uh, 99%. Be careful, the error bar is quite large. Okay. So maybe I will skip this slide, but I would like only to flash that this was the readout performance in all the community of superconducting qubits. So this was the standard one that is used by all the other groups. It's a transverse group And with the best fidelity was made in the zero group with typically 99.6%. And here with our cross care coupling, we have approximated quite uh, close in this state of the art of superconducting qubits. So it's quite promising, and we are continuing in this direction of research. So this is the summary. So I hope that I introduce transform qubit. Now it sounds more clear for you what is a superconducting qubit. I, I, I flash you a recent results about quantum measurement and implementation. And maybe I, I would like you to mention uh, what are the near future in our book in terms of research. So in terms of quantum measurements, we will be interested to study the polariton when the polariton enters inside the nonlinear regimes. So there is interesting results in this nonlinear regime that could be interesting. Also to see how the photon numbers here are present to results where the photon number in the polariton is typically between 1 to 10. But it's interesting to perform systematic measurement and to see how the number of polaritons here could affect the qubit, so how this could affect the quantum non diminution for example. And we are starting to scale up to try to make a platform with four qubits, but this is a long-term research. So uh, there is a fluxonium qubit, which is starting now with the coming of quantum artificial. And there is a new direction of intrinsically protective superconducting qubits by playing uh, circuits in order to no more play with the poor pairs, but playing with the pairs of couple pairs. And this has interesting properties to reinforce the coherence of this kind of circuit. So maybe uh, I would like to flash that in Cornobel, there is a strong community of quantum information. So there is not only activity of superconducting qubits, but there is a strong activity of spin qubits, uh, Miguel Novat, 
There is a strong activity now on spin qubit in germanium or silicon uh, devices. There is people working in quantum optics, spin tronics, nanomechanics also, and a very strong community of quantum materials. And quantum materials continue to be a very important research field to help the people to imagine new kind of process which can occur in physics. And this is uh, studying superconductivity, non-conventional superconductivity, strongly correlated electrons, quantum magnetism, topological insulator. There's many topics which are interesting to call. And in all these topics, but they are emerged, there is typically 200 permanent researchers. And of course, there is many proposals of PhD studies in these things, and we got some new fundings for the next years. So uh, this is open to any kind of student who wants to start a PhD uh, in Grenoble. So I will have, this is my last slide. So uh, all this work has been made inside this group, and uh, this is important, and particularly uh, we benefit from the work of Remy Dassonville and Vladimir during their PhD thesis. And now there is a new PhD student, Cyril Mori, who is uh, starting to develop new experiments. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. Uh, we did a uh, presentation on work. Uh, very interesting. Uh, my question is uh, what is so what are what is the main source of the coherence when you're doing the graph explorations and the result? And uh, the average number of photos at the time that you know. Okay. So, the research of the coherence, maybe in cosmos uh, the people have shown that when we change the capacitance to over materials, which is less foxidal than aluminum, we improve the coherence time by a factor two or three. So, we can suspect that the main source of the coherence is due to inside layers around the superconducting parts or between the superconducting and the surface, which produce some defects, level system, but absorbs some uh, microwave energy in the excitations. So I, I would say that and it's why we start vulnerable to try to perform new kind of circuits with Tantala in the pit rate and see if we can improve our acceleration time. So this is, to be honest, there is many more source. So in your case, for example, we are with the 20 microsecond precession time. So could be still a problem of the number of fabrication with some residual crisis. So you are could be many over result, but in terms of uh, the state of the art people, I think this is the main of something better. So the second question is what are what is the presentation? Yeah, the average not on them. So you see. So there is two kind of excitation that can emerge inside the cavity or inside the qubit. So for the qubit, you see the phenomenon don't do this selection. The population is 90% in the wrong state and 10%. So you can calculate and this was not very big temperature. For the cavity, I think it's a bit larger. It's more of the effective temperature of 80, um, 80 millikelvin. Okay, the cavity has an energy which is higher, which is typically 70 years. So maybe it will be of the same amount of. I just want to relate to the question. Um, what's the most promising in the qubits? The one uh, the electronic or the photonic one for the radiations? No, if I want to come back to, but if I want to survive to the final work club, I should not have certain location because that is with me or the girls. But I would say that uh, this is my point of view, this is important for young people who are very stuck to quantum computer. And I think any kind of duration of fundamental research are really welcome to improve our knowledge and Imagine what would be the best one. Personally, I don't think a transform qubit will be a good feature because the transform qubit will be easy to do the experience. But the problem is that uh, transform qubit is sometimes too close to classical states. And as soon as that works on decoherence, in some sense, 
Donc, il dit, you have a dose, but the question is, is this a dose? Is due to control effect or because of the dynamics of the classical system? And so, I think that fictional we have more change because it's much more to level system. And uh, it over uh, people of the uh, IS people over the domain, and that the people that serve it. What is true is supercomputing system is very flexible and it's far to be converting in a single solution. We are still poking many ideas. So it's interesting in terms of no, term of fundamental physics, but I don't think it's very nice. But I think uh, so no answer. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I want to survive. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's still a very good answer. Don't hesitate any question I want to answer. There is some uh, evolved quality in this kind of physics that I love. Yes, it's not all Yes. It's, uh, I, I, to, to be honest, this is my vision because I am, yeah, we are a small group in some sense. To do evolved questions, you need to have a massive number of qubits. And uh, I, I will privilege that in Norbo to push in current time. So to have a small number of qubits with a long current time and to find the simulations with the norms. But not to be, but of course, uh, it will have the possibility to test something when not. But uh, uh, to be in terms of quantum error correction, I think the state of the art now is, is made by the cat qubits. But I think the group of Pierre and Michel de Moré, they show that they can improve the currents by the quantity lambda and the time, effective for a sign of no by a factor of three. So they believe they succeed to improve the current time for the first time, starting to have this evaluation. In terms of the platform of our app, they do succeed to have. Even with the error correction in this platform, the best error correction don't actually the best repeat of the platform. But uh, of course, it's problem if they do the win a factor of 10 of for accession time, uh, the fix is not so bad to the right of the name. As you said, the transform is kind of plastic or not very fun because I have many levels to very exciting and bunch of uh, states. Uh, so I wonder if I am hydrating. Uh, computer to be interesting, some big stuff, quantum elements, a bit of classical. But yes, I, I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah, I think it would be very dangerous because I would say that uh, you see, uh, in terms of transform, you have to transform the two couple them. And the problem is, as soon as the two thing is uh, some other of any of the near level of the problem, do not speak more about transform, you should still take the three levels. So, uh, to do something which should be this, it will be, of course, it will be not really this because the experiments at the end of the system hold the classical. So I am convinced that turning a classic, random, classical transition is interesting. So this sounds interesting. And for example, when we want to study this, um, this really photon liquid, I think you are studying our inventory. You are playing a bit between quantum and classical distinctions, but it, it should be, this is a, a wish. It would be a bit so, uh, you know, it's a bit more to have an importance. Okay, but, uh, any, any further questions? Yeah. Students would like the best. Yeah, no, don't hesitate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I will be around in the moment. Yeah, he's offering jobs, so you should ask him. Right? No, yes, 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 of course. Don't work something which is uh, very good. Uh, okay, all right. Let's thank Olivia for the nice part.